Thank you very much, Sue. Thank you very much. Um, well, slugs and snails are one of my favorite subjects. Um, I know not everyone uh, loves them. Um, as a fact, fact, most gardeners probably don't like them. But, um, but I'm just fascinated by them. I'm interested in them. And, um, and so what I've learned, I think I can help you out with so that you can become a better slug hunter um, if, if you so desire. So one of the things I'm asked so many times is what in the world are they for? Well, if you need moisturizing, the slugs and snails can help you. This is an actual thing that people do. I'm not sure you can do it here in Vancouver and Portland area, but um, there are moisturizers that you can buy that have slug slime in them. I can hear you all going, ew, but um, it's an actual thing. It's supposed to be an excellent moisturizer. Um, someone in one of my talks said that uh, her sister or sister-in-law um, had been given one of these moisturizing products, products and thought it was fabulous. So, so there's, there's one thing slugs uh, and snails do. Uh, slug, snail farming, not slug farming, but snail farming is a huge business. $12 billion a year uh, is made in the snail farming business. Um, there are festivals to celebrate this and they use uh, tons and tons and tons of snails uh, for these festivals. And this year it has been canceled, I will tell you that. I checked on it. Um, and this, uh, this snail festival in Spain, um, we don't yet have that here in the United States, but um, they, uh, they have a, a great time with it, I guess. Um, so what else did we do? We have snail caviar. Oh my goodness, um, things that we never even thought of. But when people ask that, they're really not asking, you know, where can I get snail caviar? They're thinking these pests are so destructive, what in the world uh, good are they? But there are a number of things that they do. Uh, these, these critters are kind of the cleanup artists in the forest. Um, they take care of things that, um, you know, kind of clean up so that there, we don't have all this uh, detritus on the forest floor. Um, so they're, they're doing that. They uh, chew up these things and then they uh, poop out <laughs> nutrients. And so the, they are part of the recycling of nutrients in the forest. They also, um, which is not a good thing, but they tend to spread disease. So that's, they're part of that cycle. And they also actually do pollinate uh, several things, so several flowers. So, um, so they are definitely part of the ecosystem of, of the forest. And, and of course we are interfering uh, by building close to the forest. So um, that's where we come in, in conflict. And people have tried crazy things with uh, slugs and snails. Um, they've hooked them up to, um, to batteries and uh, because of the glucose in their blood system, you actually could run a very small calculator using a snail. Um, so, so there are lots of uses for these. So when people ask why, uh, there's a couple of things you can tell them. Um, the, we have lots and lots of native uh, slugs and snails uh, in Oregon and Washington. Um, the entire Pacific Northwest. So they are definitely part of our ecosystem, uh, but there are uh, exotics that have been brought in from various places, Asia, uh, England, California, um, that are, have become pests here. About 50%, 40 to 50% of our um, slugs and snails in the area are, have come, are not native um, and have come from, from other places. Uh, but this guy is a native. Our uh, lovely banana slug um, is definitely a forest a native. Um, he or she um, survives on, um, they love mushrooms and they're, as I say, part of that uh, cleanup of the forest floor system. Um, one thing unusual about these guys is that they're out in the daytime. Um, I know if you've been hiking, you've come across them and they don't seem to mind being out in the daytime, 
whereas most of them, as you know, uh, are nighttime critters. So this is one of the most common ones we have. This is, uh, they, it's called the European red slug, but it does come in other colors. Um, so we, we don't mind that. Um, this is the one um, that uh, when, you, when you disturb it, it shrinks up, you know, becomes kind of really humped up like you see in the picture on the left. Um, and it has a real uh, interesting texture. They're quite large and fat when they get uh, humped up like that. Um, and they generally have that reddish skirt around the, around the uh, edge of them. So uh, this is your European red slug, or uh, if it uh, uh, comes in a darker color, it could be the European black slug. Um, one thing you'll notice about these that's different um, is those black tentacles. The, um, many of them, the tentacles are just are the same color as the slug, but in this case, that red skirt and those dark tentacles are the way you can tell that this is your European red slug. Now this guy, this is the prettiest slug, isn't it? I mean, it's tiger stripes, uh, leopard spots on the front there. It's a really good looking uh, uh, slug. I, I'm, am I hearing th people going, ew, this is not good looking? But yes, this is a good looking slug. Um, and he is a cannibal. He will eat, um, he will eat other slugs. And uh, so this doesn't mean he won't eat your, your vegetables, but it, it does uh, go after um, other kinds of slugs. Now, in order for it to do this, right, it has to catch them. So what's different about this guy is that it's fast for a slug. So if you think of the previous one that uh, the, well, let's take the banana slug. The banana slug will do the 100 yard dash in about nine hours, okay? But this leopard slug um, or the great gray slug uh, will do the 100 yard dash in about two and a half hours. So you see how much faster it is, relatively speaking, uh, than other slugs. So um, if you uh, run across this one, you will uh, probably not notice that it's much faster than the other guys. This one is the one that is the most destructive. This is the one you'll find in our, um, in the strawberries, as you say, and in, in, in many of the, um, the garden. It's very destructive. Now, the, um, it's, it only gets to be about an uh, inch and a half or maybe two inches. Um, in its normal size. Most slugs can stretch out 11 times their, their normal length and they can get through soda straws and you know under anything they want really. They're really um, really able to get anywhere. But this one is really for its size is really the most destructive uh, one in our garden. There are lots of different kinds of slugs out there. This one, you see the little tiny shell there on the, um, on the back? Um, it is a, a semi-slug or uh, it has that little shell that's left over, I suppose, from uh, days gone by. These are primarily uh, underground. They eat worms. Um, so they are primarily underground. So you don't see them. Uh, they are in our area, so uh, sometime you may be turning over uh, garden dirt or something, and, and there they'll be, kind of this lighter color, and you'll see that tiny little uh, shell, about the size of your pinky fingernail um, on the back, so that's an interesting one. Now with snails, there's just, you know, tons of them out there. I mean, as I say, about half of them are pests, uh, exotics that, um, that, that trouble us. This is the brown garden snail. Um, it's uh, about the size of a ping pong ball, I think, when they're, when they're fully grown. Um, and it is the most destructive one uh, that we see. Um, we don't like to blame the Californians for everything, but it did come from California. So um, uh, here it is. Um, what, one thing that's interesting about this one is the way that it holds its shell. It will hold its shell kind of up. You see on the picture on the left how it's more roundish and held up in the air. Um, now one of our native uh, slug uh, snails here, uh, the Pacific sideband, has a shell that's about the same size. 
um, but you see how it's held on the side uh, more than the than the uh, brown garden snail. So that would be a way if you see a, a snail out there with a nice robust shell, think, oh, is this the one I should uh, uh, throw into the street? Or is this, um, this is our native. So you know, take a look at that shell. Is it is it up like a ping pong ball or is it held more flat? And then you can tell the difference between those. So um, I'm gonna take a couple of questions in a couple of slides, but let's talk about uh, the slug um, and snail biology here. Uh, so here's your basic slug. Um, um, you see the tentacles there. Uh, the top ones are used for seeing uh, as, as, as such. They don't, you know, they can't recognize faces, but um, they uh, can see dark and light. Of course, uh, the ones that are trying to hide from the light so that birds or their other pests don't find them, um, they can detect light and darkness. Uh, they tend to go toward darkness um, when it's light and toward the light when it's dark. So at night, that's why you'll see them sometimes on your porch or patio where your night light is. Um, so they, those upper tentacles see that light. Uh, the lower tentacles are more for smelling. They, they don't smell really the way we do, but they kind of detect odors, the chemicals, uh, the chemical odors. Uh, so those are the lower ones. And then the mouth is, is on the bottom. We'll take a, a look at that a little closer a little later. Um, now, in the front part of the, the slug uh, is that mantle, and it's usually a different uh, sh uh, texture than the, um, than the rest of the, the critter. Um, and it will, you'll be able to see that breathing hole. That's its breathing hole there. And, and it, you usually can see that if you, uh, if you got a hold of a, a, slug, or a slug there. So uh, you can see that. Um, Underneath that mantle are all of its other um, its lungs and uh, its tummy and all that stuff are underneath that mantle. And, um, and that's uh, so if you are um, have in the woods and you have nothing to eat and you see a slug, um, that mantle has all the organs in front of it. You don't want to eat that. You want to eat the back, which is all muscle. So. Um, so hopefully you'll never be in that position, um, but uh, now you know. Uh, so uh, what else? Oh yes, the foot is the part underneath. Um, we call that the foot. Uh, and that is where the, uh, the slime is produced. Now slime is critical to slugs and snails. Uh, it's so important to their, um, their life cycle that 30% of the nutrients they take in are used to make slime. And they have two kinds of slime. The down the center makes a, uh, of the foot makes a sticky slime, which is what enables them to crawl up uh, trees, up the side of your house, um, and it, get them anywhere they wanna go. Um, so that's the center. Uh, on the edges of that underneath foot, uh, a sticky slime, uh, no, I'm not a sticky slime, a slimy slime uh, is produced and that they produce that so they can go over with that any kind of uh, rough surface without damaging uh, their 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 foot. Uh, so so that's two kinds of slime. Now the slime is really interesting to uh, to many people. Um, they study it for fluid mechanics, how uh, how the slugs and snails move over it, uh, so that they if, when people who are interested in fluid mechanics. Um, so how do we float over certain surfaces uh, by using the same methodologies of the slime and the, um, and the muscles that the, that the slugs use? Also medical people are interested in slug slime because uh, the sticky quality of it would be great to use instead of sutures in, uh, in, in medical procedures. So there are a lot of um, uses for the other people who are interested in um, in slug slime itself, so that's that's kind of interesting. They um, they can form a slime thread and lower themselves down from a branch. 
Uh, sometimes they will, if a bird um, grabs them by the tail, they can put out a slug, I mean, a slime plug and uh, will gum up the, the bird. So their slime is really, really useful to them. It also helps keep them um, uh, moisture inside uh, so they, they don't dry out. Um, it's just very useful to them. They, as they, as they uh, go over things, if they, things stick to them, dirt or whatever, it just kind of washes off with the slime. One thing I wanted to say about slime uh, is one interesting thing about it is that it will absorb 40 times its volume in water. So when you get some on your hands or your pants or whatever, when you're out in the garden, don't add water because that just makes more of it. So 40 times is the volume of water. What you want to do to get slime off your hands or your clothing is just rub it. It will ball up uh, much like rubber cement. We all remember rubber cement. Um, it'll ball up just like that on your hands or on your clothes and, and just go away. But the important thing is not to add water. Uh, so uh, snails are very similar. They have the tentacles, they have the, the foot, but it's the shell that is on top of that mantle uh, and covers up their internal organs. Um, that, is, that is the main difference. So um, under that shell will be their breathing hole, will be where they poop out, and uh, all their um, sex parts are under there. Um, and so that's, uh, that's the primary difference is that little house there uh, protects all their internal organs. So um, are there any questions uh, that I could answer? I'll take a little break here just in case. Erica? There's one question inquiring about whether diatomaceous earth is effective on snails and slugs. Uh, diatomaceous earth, for people who don't know that, is uh, made from um, kind of sea creatures and it's very sharp and pokey. Um, and it's, it, it is sometimes used to protect things. The trouble with diatomaceous earth in the Pacific Northwest, uh, it has other places it, it works better than it does here, is we are so humid here and then we're watering our gardens that the, the water beads up and goes in between those pokey uh, parts of the diatomaceous earth. So it's not really as effective here in the outside uh, as it is in other places because of our high humidity here. But use all the tools you can. Anything else? There's another question about coffee grounds keeping slugs away from pastas. And um, then eggshells is also there. Right. Um, so the theory behind that is that the eggshells and the um, the coffee grounds are rough and they don't want to go over it. Um, slugs and snails will go across ground glass. Uh, they, that's all, they can put out enough slime to make that layer so they can just slide over it. So um, as I say, use any tools you can, but um, not all of those kind of things are going to be as effective, but um, different tools for different places. Anything so else? This then came hazelnut shells, and then are they repelled by copper wire? I'll talk about copper wire in a little bit. Um, hazelnut shells have the same um, issue. Uh, their pokiness isn't going to bother them. But what does bother them, if, if for anybody who's used hazelnut shells, is the water moves through them very quickly. And so a layer of, of, uh, of hazelnut shells uh, is dry on the top, and then they're not uh, particularly um, happy about that, but they could slip under that uh, and would because it's dark and may be moist under the hazelnut shells. So, and I will talk about copper wire a little bit later. Shall I go on? Yes, that's all for now. All right, I will go on. Let's get to the next one. Um, so slugs uh, have this um, rasping tongue. Uh, so they have a really rough top of their mouth and then this a rough tongue that uh, grabs the food and kind of rakes it over the, the bony top of the, of the mouth. And that's why slug uh, 
damage is so ragged because of this shredding action that they do. Um, and as you see, pretty, pretty, uh, pretty destructive with that tongue. Um, they will eat almost anything, uh, but they are looking mostly for things that are dying. Like they're not the ones in the, in the, um, in the in ecosystem that uh, break down uh, things that are dead. They're not decomposers. And if something is robustly growing and thick, they're not likely to go after that either. They're going after things that, that are on the downside, or in the case of seedlings, uh, they are uh, going after things that don't have good natural defenses yet. Uh, seedlings haven't quite built up their, uh, in their natural defenses. And so sometimes planting starts will, uh, will be a little bit better uh, because they're uh, less attractive. They will eat about twice their weight in uh, food a day, and they can, are able to extract 90% of the nutrients in what they eat. So this is an incredibly uh, efficient um, critter out there as far as getting food uh, is concerned. But sometimes we wonder, is this uh, slugs and snails or is it something else? So remember that raggedy appearance. Um, that's generally going to be your slugs and snails, whereas cabbage worms, cutworms, things like that have, make that nice scallopy, as you see here, the nice scallopy edge uh, because of the way, the way they eat. And it's a little cleaner on the, on the edges uh, because of the way they eat. And then black vine weevils, uh, which is, gets after um, many things, mostly rhododendrons, uh, primroses, lots of things. Uh, they look, uh, their damage looks, is complete totally on the edges. Uh, it looks like somebody's taken a paper punch and gone around there. So you can mistake their damage for something else. You don't always see the slime. So uh, hard to say sometimes, but watch for that ty type of eating. Uh, and that can sometimes help you just decide what's eating the crops. Uh, so there's, what we want to do is understand the, the behavior kind of of the slugs. What are they after? What's going on with them? So that we can interfere in that and kind of get our, um, uh, get our control in, in line. So uh, they need moisture, as, as we know. So anytime we can uh, dry out an area or um, with mulch or something else, um, uh, that can be really, really critical for them to keep that going. They prefer over uh, 50 degrees temperature. So, um, so that's why we see them not in the winter and not in the heat of the summer, usually, uh, because those temperatures bother them. And uh, what they do to avoid those temperatures, uh, either freezing or too hot, is they go down into the soil. They move through wormholes. Remember I said they can get 11 times their length. Um, and they will go down through wormholes or dot dead root holes um, and they will go down to six feet down into the soil so they can avoid heat and uh, and cold pretty easily. Um, I did say that they're they like the light during the night and the dark during the day except of course our banana slugs which are out the day. Um, the, they're very they're territorial but you didn't know that they have a territory and um, we wonder, well, how big is their territory? Well, there was some work done in England. Um, some citizen science scientists uh, did some work with snails. Uh, they wrote their names or whatever it was on their shells and then took them um, far away. And then they saw, they would see which ones came back. And it turns out that uh, in their experiment, um, the snails were able to return uh, if they were put away less than 66 feet. Um, and 66 feet is because they use a metric system over there. Um, so if you're trying to get rid of them, you, you can't just throw them into your neighbor's yard. You have to throw them into the next neighbor's yard uh, and, then, and then, then they won't come back. Um, and they are territorial, they will fight for territory. Um, if you ever see two slugs fighting, um, that would be something. They're very strong. They can pull 50 times their own weight um, along, the, along the flat. And don't you want to see which scientists were assigned to figure that out? 
uh, hooking up little carts to them or something, I'm not sure. And I did talk about their speed. So some of them are faster than others. Now, one thing uh, about uh, the fight that we, that we try and do with these guys is how efficient they are in reproducing. Um, they are, uh, most people know they are hermaphrodites, so they are, they can be, can be both sexes. Generally, they start out male, most species, then they become hermaphroditic, um, male and female parts. And then um, toward the end of their lives, they're uh, more on the female side. So what this means is that when two of them come together, both of them can go uh, and lay eggs after that. Uh, so that is, um, that's so, that's why they're so efficient and they don't need to lay eggs right away. They can hold on to that in, in their bodies and then wait until they find the perfect spot. Uh, they like to, slugs will like to be um, under clods of dirt or uh, under leaves, um, rock gardens they love because they can get in there and hide their eggs um, when they find that perfect high humidity spot, uh, snails will actually dig down into the soil in order to uh, make a little, um, like a burrow, to put their eggs in there. Um, so, so these guys are pretty efficient. One slugger snail can lay up to uh, 500 eggs per season. And uh, if you've ever seen these little eggs out there, uh, they can be translucent, transparent, a little bit of white. Um, usually there's 10 or 30 of them um, together. As they say, maybe when you're cleaning up leaves or something, you can, you'll see them. Um, and if, and this doesn't happen of course, but if one slug laid 500 eggs per season, the next time there would be a quarter of a million. So, uh, but they don't all survive. Um, they are, their eggs are prey, and of course they are prey for other things. They live about six to 18 months, usually. Um, not, not very long, but some of them um, can, can live quite a long time. Uh, so I I'm, I'm, could take another break now before we talk about controlling uh, what methodologies work and, and what all the kind of methodologies there are. Um, if there are any question, any more questions, Erica, I would take them now. Well, there is a, a multifaceted question, but I think you've gotten to it. It says, what are snails trying to get to eat and are they territorial and yes. same distance that they'll return and where do they go in winter and summer? So I, ah. you've kind of hit most of that, but maybe not all. Yeah, let me just say something about winter and summer. If you look at the natural, um, kind of the natural way of the seasons, uh, it's moist in the spring, uh, so they would be out there, um, you know, mating, laying eggs, eating, whatnot. And then the summer would come, it's very hot. They would go down to, into the ground to protect themselves. Then uh, the fall rains start and the temperatures come down. And then they would come out, they, um, they breed then primarily in the fall, and then uh, lay the eggs, which then hatch out in the spring. And that would be the way it would work. But what happens is we, in our gardens, we water all summer. So we keep our gardens both moist and cool in the summer. And so they have no reason to go, leave uh, our gardens to, to dig down. Um, so, so that is why these, they really get to be a pest, uh, is because we have changed the environment to make it happy for them all year round. And this is, these are great reasons why we do some xeriscaping. We, we don't water all our areas. Maybe we let our lawns go dry. Um, we're looking for those plants that don't need to be watered in the summer. And that's really gonna reduce that habitat that they love. So, um, so thinking about that kind of thing as well, that's one more way, uh, one more kit in our tool uh, one more tool in our in our kit for controlling them is watching uh, where we water. So, so I will go on and we'll talk some more. So um, when we think of all the ways that we can approach uh, controlling them, um, let's start with preventing. Can we prevent 
them. Uh, are there, there are deer resistant plants, rabbit resistant plants? Are there slug resistant plants? Well, yes, there are. And you don't just have to grow something not so fabulous. Um, take a look, slugs avoid eating wonderfully beautiful things. You know, this would be a terrific garden um, with uh, in, in, in shady areas, uh, bleeding hearts, um, uh, not that we all want to put in ivies, but many of the ivies. Uh, sweet woodruff, what a wonderful ground cover that is. Uh, so there are a number, and these, these uh, it's on your handout, but there's, these are, lists are not exhaustive. Uh, you can Google what slugs don't like to eat or what they love, and you can find more things on this list. So yes, we can plant areas of our garden that will be very nice looking, um, but that, that will not be attacked by slugs and scales. And then we can go to other areas and use different tools uh, for things that slugs love to eat. Um, and on that love to eat section, um, you take a look at some of the things that people really hate uh, the slugs to get after. Uh, for example, strawberries. Well, I used to grow hood strawberries, the favorite one of the Pacific Northwest, um, and the slugs did get into it. But I realized that the little, um, those little French strawberries, the alpine strawberries that I was also growing, they were never bothered by this, the slugs. Uh, so I pulled out the hoods, we'll tell you that, and now only grow the little alpine strawberries and have no trouble with, uh, with slugs and snails. Uh, so so you, there are ways of uh, even dealing with the uh, slugs, uh, slugs fate and snail favorite foods. So I think lettuce is another one. I no longer grow lettuce in my garden. I grow it in containers uh, up on uh, up on the porch, the concrete porch, which they don't get to, or up on a little shelving uh, so they don't get up there. So there's ways you can do that uh, using containers and other things so that they don't go after your um, your guys and hostas. I just want to talk about hostas because that uh, seems to be a bane of uh, for the slug and snail. It's, it's really a um, problem with hostas. So this is my yard. Uh, these, this is one of my slugs. Um, and they slime around as you see, but look at my hostas. They are untouched and they will be untouched the whole season. And that's because of the kind of hosta I grow. If a leaf is stiffer, and so you know that some of the hostas are quilted, they're a little stiffer, blue color, and quilted, or that ridged part, uh, they don't like those. So if you want to grow hostas, these are the hostas to grow. Uh, they also won't go after things like geraniums because they have that stiff, more stiff leaf. So they're even of the slug and snails favorite food, you can grow certain kinds of it. So you actually can plant a slug resistant garden. Um, and then another thing is, do you know where they are? Uh, you want to know where they're hiding. Remember I said that they were uh, in uh, uh, places that are, have 100% humidity. They love that. Anything above 70 they're pleased with. So this is my yard. Uh, rock gardens, lots of uh, ferns and little critters growing around there. And this is the location they love. And so what I know is because I know where they are, um, uh, ground covers, uh, places that are shaded all day, because I know where they are, if I wanted to um, go after them with a bait or some other kind of control measure, knowing where they are tells me where to put my control measures. So thinking about in your yard, where are they likely to be hiding during the day? That's where, um, that's where you can put your control measures. Because if they are, take for example, if the slugs are uh, hiding in, amongst all these ferns and at night they come across that lawn into my vegetable garden, um, what I know is if I'm going to put down bait is I can put it right uh, outside of these, this, um, this moist uh, fern covered area because they're going to hit my slug bait first and, uh, and my vegetable garden will be safe. So understanding uh, where they like to be uh, and how you can use that to your advantage, whether you're using traps or whatever you're using, 
um, but understanding their biology and their behavior is what's really important. So there's lots of options for control um, in integrated pest management. We always start with the cultural and the physical things we can do uh, before we jump into the bait. So things as simple as when you water make a huge difference. They did a piece of research uh, to think about this. And so they, um, they watered the garden uh, in the evening. Okay, there we go. We were watering in the evening. We come home from work. We water the garden. And what they found was watering at night, they got about 40% damage. So 40% of the leaves were damaged by the slugs. Then they said, okay, let's try um, watering at, um, at night and putting bait out. Okay, that must be better. So they watered at night and putting out bait and they got down to about 12% damage, eight to 12% damage. Well, that's certainly uh, an improvement. We have much less damage there. But then they, they looked at what if we watered in the morning? So they watered in the morning and they found that they got the same 12% damage, eight to 12% damage that they got if they use bait. So just by moving from an evening watering to a morning watering, they got the same amount of damage, but they didn't have to use bait. So we can do things just in the way we take care of our plants, how we approach the care of our plants that can reduce the damage that we have. Sanitation is important, leaving out pots and, um, boards and stepping stones and things like that all around the garden, leaving it a little bit messy in that way, uh, gives them a place to find, to hide. And so that's, uh, that's going to be a problem. Uh, if we can pick up some of those things, if we can um, make sure our pathways are clear, uh, that we're not just leaving things around um, when, we're, when we're doing our yard maintenance, um, that would certainly help. Uh, mulch or no mulch, um, they do, as I said, with the, the uh, hazelnut shells, they do. Claudia, can you hear us? Claudia, I'm afraid we, we may have lost you. We may need you to log out and log back in. So oh, you, you know, using mulch in some areas is not going to increase your slug um, damage because the balance can be under there. But there are, if you want to, areas with no mulch that will be drier and that will also, um, will also keep the slugs uh, and snails away. So there's many different tools and different parts of your yard are more, maybe more appropriate for different tools. So you have to think about that. So if you're going to be a really good slug hunter, you want to think about what parts of your garden you can use different um, controls in. And you can always hand pick them, of course. Uh, take your headlamp out at night, your neighbors will think you're crazy, and pick up, uh, pick up all those uh, slugs and snails. Um, you can do some other prevention barriers. This is the copper that we, uh, we were thinking about earlier. So copper strips around the edge of uh, containers, around the edge of raised beds, those work. Um, on the right, you see uh, this mesh, uh, this, this kind of a, a mesh, a copper mesh that can be wrapped around the trees. You can use that. Uh, there's a copper netting you could use around the pots. So the copper is something that's, um, that works. It does tend to work better on snails than slugs. I don't know why, um, but that it has been noted in the research. Um, and then we talked about diatomaceous earth, lime, ashes, coffee grounds, things like that. Those are also barriers. They may not be 100%, but as I say, different tools in different part of your garden is what's going to um, is what's going to win the day. Um, some people have thought about solarizing. That's when you put plastic over before you plant. It gets really hot under there um, and, and that heat goes down 
about an inch and you can really kill some eggs with that. Uh, not all of us solarize all our beds, but there are, as I say, lots of different ways depending on uh, where you're going. The other ounce of prevention is to grow a very diverse garden. Um, if you're having lots of plants and uh, levels, trees, shrubs, flowers, um, this will bring in birds and toads and snakes, for those of us who like snakes, um, and all kinds of insects that are predators to the uh, slugs and snails. So having that diversity in our yards is another thing that's going to keep the slugs and snails in balance and not let them get control. Uh, there's also trapping. We can trap them. Uh, there's lots of different kinds of traps that you can get, um, uh, you can purchase um, and uh, put whatever you like in it. Um, but uh, under boards, um, you they would uh, you'd find them there in the morning, the uh, under the boards, and you just scrape them off. Um, you could put out uh, when you're done with your cantaloupe or your uh, morning grapefruit. Uh, you can just put that down there. They will get under there, pop it up in the morning. There they are, out they go. So there are all kinds of things like that that you can use. And homemade ones work just as well. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. It's easy. We've all probably got uh, these containers, uh, cottage cheese or yogurt or whatever it is. And to, just to put um, little holes in them um, near the ridge, you, you leave the top intact so you can put the lid on it. Um, that keeps, if you put bait or beer or whatever you're gonna put in it, um, this keeps it from the rain from getting in. Also, it keeps um, little doggy noses from getting in there and maybe getting in trouble. Um, so one thing I wanna say about the holes, you always read that, uh, you know, put these holes at the level of the, um, the soil level. Slugs can climb up trees and up the side of your house. They easily can go up, no matter what you do with this. They can go up and find that beer or whatever you're putting in there. Um, you don't need to put it at, at um, soil level. And if you do put it at soil level, many of the little good guys, like those ground beetles and some of the other things, will be running along and they'll fall in there. And you don't want to lose your good, uh, beneficial insects. So uh, keep those holes a little bit raised, uh, regardless of what you read in the books. I don't mean to, I don't mean to criticize other people. Yes, I do. Um, anyway, there are lots of baits. Beer is the classic. Um, and it has to do with the yeast that's in it, the sugar in the yeast. They don't actually drown. Uh, you'd have to hold one under the water for about 24 hours to get it to drown. Whereas there's something in the yeast, the brewer's yeast uh, and the beer that, um, that does uh, kill them. So beer, uh, yeast and lettuce, they love lettuce. I sometimes, if I'm trying to uh, catch them uh, for a demonstration I'm doing, I'll just uh, chop up some lettuce with some yeast, put it under a board, and in the morning I've got more slugs than I know what to do with. The other thing they love is cornmeal. They just love cornmeal. Um, so there's, you could put that under a board to attract them. Any kind of bran, wheat bran, that would be great. Um, as I said, the melons. Uh, and one thing they're finding down at Oregon State now is cucumbers. There's something in cucumbers. Uh, they're trying to isolate the exact compound, but cucumbers, grind up those cucumbers and they make a great uh, attractant now, one of the newer ones. Of course, now, now that you have them, what do you do with them? Um, clearly, soapy water may not be the thing to do. Look at them run from that soapy water. But um, ammonia, you know, a, a bucket with some ammonia and water in it or vinegar and water. You can put them out in the trash, um, put them in your yard debris bucket, throw them out into the street. Um, you can also put them in the freezer. That's kind of a kind way of doing it. They go to sleep and then that's it. Um, I don't know how many people want to put them in the freezer. Um, I do have a bucket in my, I will tell you, in my freezer that says bugs on it, so I don't mistake it for yogurt, um, uh, that I, if I have to uh, slow down some insects or um, find one in my yard, 
that I don't need into the bug it goes, into the bug jar it goes. Um, there are repellent project, products out there. I have used one of them and it worked okay. Uh, there's not a lot of research on this. Uh, the problem was I had to spray it every single night uh, because with the dew and raining and watering the garden, um, they, uh, it washes off. So uh, it did work, the one worked for me, um, but I did have to do it every night. So there are chemicals. Um, this is, I think what we're most familiar with are the slug baits. There are really two, maybe three types. The metaldehyde is the one we've uh, associated with deadline um, for many years. There's a bunch of different ones, but the metaldehyde um, damages the, the, uh, the slime producing cells and they are unable to keep um, their moisture in. And so if they can't produce a slime, as important as it is to them, they, they have problems. And that's why you'll see, when you use the bait, you'll see the, the slugs or the snails um, kind of surrounded by slime and dead. Now with the iron phosphate baits or the other sodium iron, uh, sodium ferric EDTA, those are iron based. Those are anti-feedants. So the slug or the snail uh, encounters those and it gives them a stomach ache. And then they, they kind of go away to hide uh, and then it kills them. So you won't see, if you use the iron, iron base baits, you won't see the dead bodies all over your driveway, um, and, but it will be working. What you'll notice is you'll have less damage. So uh, that's the, the uh, difference between those two. Sulfur also, uh, there is a bait that contains sulfur, um, which is also um, poisonous to them. So uh, they are attracted by the what's in the bait and then uh, get the chemical along with it. But it's not just a matter of throwing them out there. Where they go is important. And we've talked about that placement, figure out where they are in your yard so you know where they're gonna be when they're hungry, um, when they're hungry in the, in the morning or at night. Uh, so they'll come out and encounter your bait. Uh, and think about your timing. They're, they hatch out in the spring, um, and that's a good time to start your baiting program to protect your, uh, your, your new vegetables or flowers. But they are not, the baby ones are not as susceptible to the bait. So in the spring, you need to be um, maintaining your bait so that they can um, encounter it as they get older. Now, summer, as I said, in the summer, they usually are going to be going away deep in the soil um, to get away from the heat. But if we're irrigating all summer, we're gonna be fighting them all summer. Um, so consider that. And then the fall is when they do start breeding. Most of them will start breeding then. So the fall is a really great time to be, uh, to be putting out your bait or any of your control measures. Because if you can stop them from breeding and stop them from laying eggs, you've saved yourself the, in the following season. So that's what's important about that fall season. So October, when it's just starting to get cooler and starting to maybe rain a little or just the humidity has gone up because it's getting into winter, um, that's the time to do a lot of your, these control measures so that they're not there come spring. So the important thing is using the correct amount. Everybody uses too much. Um, look on the label and see how much you should be using. This is what it should look like. This is, uh, you can't see that. Very tiny. This is how much, look at that. That's how much for a square foot. So one foot, 12 inches, square foot. Um, that's how much for a square foot. Don't put it in piles. We want them to find it wherever they are, uh, to be attracted here and there and not uh, go to our, to our plants. So, um, so look on the labels, see how much you should be using and scatter it out in the area to, uh, to catch them. Um, the, most of these baits are colored, either they're white or they're blue, so that you can see whether they're being taken up and then, then replace it if they're being taken up. Um, otherwise, every two weeks is a, is a good time to put them out. 
We do see beetles and uh, worms taking the baits. They're not affected by the slug baits, but they do like the uh, bram uh, or whatever is using for the bait. Um, and they use that for nutrition for themselves. So it's not always your fault uh, if, if the bait doesn't appear to be working. There's a lot of research, as I said, going on down at Oregon State and around the uh, country because we are not the only place that has problems with slugs and snails. Um, so that we're looking at anti feedings things uh, that will keep the slugs and snails from um, from eating this or going after the plants in the first place. And then they're looking for improved attractants. As I say, cucumbers are one of the ones that they're looking at. We're also seeing the killer nematodes. Now, most of you may be familiar with spraying nematodes to kill flea eggs, um, um, black vine weevils, strawberry root weevils, things like that um, in, in the yard. Um, but there are nematodes that focus on slugs and snails. And these nematodes have been used for many years in England, um, but they were not brought to the United States because they were afraid the, they might do something else. So they were uh, trying to figure that out when they discovered that they actually are here anyway, um, just we hadn't been looking closely enough. So we are going to be seeing those nematodes in the future um, I'm not sure how long the future, uh, but they are going through the, the process of testing here in the United States so that we will be able to use that. Um, this marsh fly, the Siomyzite, um, is uh, one that does prey on the slugs and snails, and it may be like the ladybugs, we could release them in our yards and they would go after uh, they would go after the slugs and snails. So there are some interesting things coming in the future. Some things that are a little out on the edge uh, is that Slugbot, which was the California Institute of Technology folks uh, got together to figure out could they design something that would, um, that would go after slugs. And it does. Uh, it, it sees them. It can perceive them. Uh, it, it grabs them. It puts them in that little pan. Uh, they, they break down and they use it for uh, energy. However, the only amount of energy they could ever get it to generate was just enough to pick up the slugs and not to do anything else. So uh, it, it really didn't go very far. And then this gentleman, he has modified a microwave to, uh, to kill them in the fields, um, similar to the solarization that I talked about. So we heat that top, we kill the ones that are in the top inches, and that's great. The other one is caffeine. This was discovered in Hawaii, uh, that it was a uh, repellent, and also at higher levels would kill them. Um, but no one has uh, continued that research because caffeine is not something you can patent. Isn't that sad? Um, so um, if, you've, if you remember that the caffeine is in the not in the grounds, but it's in the, in the coffee itself, um, which is why we drink it, right? Uh, so th that's what does, the caffeine is what does it. Um, so my, I, to summarize it up, um, think about uh, the fact that you're not gonna get rid of all of them. So you're just looking to get them down to a uh, manageable level. Um, take a look at the different methods that you have available that you're willing to use. You know, do you have enough margarine containers? Whatever you're going to do, um, combine those methods in different parts of your yard. Uh, focus on fall, get it on your um, calendar that to do some um, baiting or some trapping in that time. Um, and then throughout the season, wherever uh, you can to, to keep them at a low level. Um, take care of your favorite plants. I know uh, I have the copper wire around some containers so they won't go up into those. So you can do, uh, do lots of different things uh, depending on where, uh, where the problems are. So think of all the control strategies we've talked about and I've listed on your handout and uh, think about where in your yard you could uh, use each one of them and then you can uh, really become a good slug, slug hunter. 
Uh, and if you want to know more about slugs and snails, um, not, to con not so much about control, but about what their lifestyle is like, uh, my favorite is the one on the right, Life in the Very Slow Lane. Um, it's a terrific read, easy to read, and just fascinating about uh, slugs and snails. So keep following that slime trail and hunt those slugs and protect your garden. Erica, are there any other questions? If not, I'm finished. There are some questions. Okay. One that says, will the same slugs that I find in my compost bin go attack my vegetable garden? In other words, should I move my compost bin if it is close to my raised beds? Um, yes, uh, they are using, uh, yes, they are the same slugs uh, and snails. They are using probably your compost pile uh, during the day as a great cool place, dark place, moist place around those edges. Of course, not in the center, which is heating up, but that's a great place for them to uh, spend the day. Uh, um, so at night they can come out and go after your vegetable garden. So between the compost pile and your vegetable garden with a great place to put your traps or your bait or move the compost pile. I see what you mean. Okay, the third question is, which baits are pet safe? Um, the, the check on your iron-based baits, um, some of them are both uh, for use in organic gardens. You'll see the label for use in organic gardens, and also they'll show which the ones that are uh, for use around pets and children and wildlife. So on the label, but um, I'm look on the uh, the iron-based ones, and uh, but be sure to see those little tags there. Okay, another question says, do slugs communicate with each other? Oh, great question. Um, they will fight, as I said, and so they um, they will defend their territory. So in that way, they're aware of one another. Also, um, and I didn't mention this about slime, when they encounter a slime trail, they can tell which way the slug was going. And so if they're interested in mating, they can turn and go and follow that slug. So in that way, uh, they, they communicate. But also, um, when they're mating, they, um, they follow each other for a long way. I suppose they're getting to know each other. I'm not really sure. Um, and they will follow each other around. So they're communicating in some way um, to show their interest and their availability or whatever. Um, so, so they do communicate in that way. Oh, and they can be trained. Um, they don't have a big brain, but they can be trained, you know, to, um, to m go through a maze or to decide whether to go right or left to get food. So they do have kind of a little bit going on up there. Okay, the next question says, are there any long-term effects from using a bait like Sluggo? Are there soil issues or contamination? Um, the, the, in talking to the companies, I've asked that question, um, it, the amount doesn't seem to be as much uh, does it, that they're using does it, uh, with the iron, because that would be what we'd be um, concerned about. Is there too much iron? Um, and it doesn't seem to be an issue. Again, this is why using the amount they say is critical because we don't want to overuse it. Um, but uh, they're, um, as far as the iron goes, you're not going to build up a toxicity. You do want to uh, be careful of um, the baits that are not pet safe or wildlife safe because they do look like seeds. That's why they're colored. Um, is so that they're less look like seeds or something, and animals could pick those up. So you do want to be careful. That's why having them in a trap like this that closes in some way is a great way to be able to use the products but still protect wildlife using the traps. Okay, let's go with one more. Okay. Uh, as in raised garden beds, do you put the bait up in the beds or down on the ground? And do you put the bait close to what you are protecting or far away? Um, the thing with many raised beds is the one of the places that is cool and moist during the day, which is what they want during the day, is right along 
the edge of that raised bed. So they will be down inside the raised bed sometimes uh, during the day. So you're looking around and you don't see anything, but they're down along that, especially those deep raised beds. So you should be putting your control measures, whether they're a trap of, of beer or um, a slug baits, uh, you should be using them both inside and outside um, so that you make sure that you're getting, um, you're trapping what you need to trap. Did I get that one? That makes sense? I think so. Anything else? So um, we've got John coming back on to close us out. Great, great. Claudia, thank you so much. That was really an uh, interesting presentation I, uh, and timely too. I mean, I'm starting to see the slug around here. Right? You know, I told you about my radishes, so. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But I will say for everybody here, a collective, ew. Because <laughs> <laughs> I know we were all doing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. But thank you so much for taking the time to, to be with us. And I look forward to seeing you again at Portland North. Right. And everybody else, thank you so much for joining us. Um, uh, we're planning on using this format in the future uh, for as long as we have to. Um, so we'll probably be using it in June uh, when uh, Ian Wilson from Portland Edible uh, Gardening will be here to talk about vegetable gardening. So have, be, take care. We hope to see you again in June uh, and have a really good night. I will make this video available on our videos webpage and I can send that link out to folks. Thanks, Claudia. Thanks, John.